a lot of good content. Uh, it's a long, it's going to be a long, um, video, but I would, I would highly suggest a lot of people stay and, and tune in for it. Yeah, I would, I would agree. It's, it's, it's really important right now. So thank you. All right. We've got Trey Griffey, long time HOA assist, long time friend of HOA assist. Um, Trey, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me today. We want to talk just insurance. So Trey's an insurance agent with Nesbit agencies. He's been doing this for over what? 10 years, About 12 years this year, 12 yeah. years this year. Yeah. Um, multi state. So you can Nesbit agencies can go anywhere in the country, yep, right? License in all 50 states. So today we want to just talk about insurance. We want to talk about what's going on in the industry. Mm -hmm. The Midwest is crazy. Minnesota specifically. I'm sure other states are similar. We want to hear from your perspective, some of the conversations that you're having with some of your clients. I'm sure a lot of them involve this premium rate hike oh, yeah. that everyone's oh, seeing yeah. so drastic. It's <laughs> just ragingly high. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the conversations that you're having with obviously these frustrated board members? Mm -hmm. How are you combating that? And just what's the, what's the status of the HOA insurance industry right mm -hmm. now? Well, sure. Well, thanks again for having me in. Yeah. And thank you for the introduction. So, uh, yeah, my name is Trey Griffin with the Nesbitt agencies. Um, and I operate our Southeastern division, uh, out of, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I currently, our, our agency currently insures, um, over 200, 200 community associations, uh, nationwide. So this is, uh, this is really an area of expertise and I've been focusing specifically on associations for, for over a decade now. So, um, this is something I'm passionate about. I've seen the market in good times. I've seen it in bad times. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, you're right. There's been a lot of, a lot of fluctuation, uh, in the property insurance market, specifically as it relates to multifamily community associations. Uh, and this is, this is nationally, you know, I operate, uh, like I said, I operate out of the Southeast. So the concern down there, um, is hurricanes and floods, you know, we're, a, we're a coastal state. So, um, that's been, that's been a huge driver of rate increases in the Southeast out West. It's, uh, it's wildfires. You see a lot of that, um, as well as they have flooding out there as well. Um, in the Midwest, um, it has been primarily, hail driven hail and, and tornadoes to a certain extent as well but what i'm getting at is on the whole the property market has what we would call hardened significantly uh, more so than i've personally ever seen in my career and that can take the form of a number of things uh, rising deductibles um, as many of your boards are probably familiar with you've probably either opted to take a higher deductible to save premium or you have potentially been forced into taking a higher deductible by your carrier um, but the biggest thing kind of the elephant in the room is your premiums um, there's no way around it. the premiums have been skyrocketing over the specifically over the past nine to 12 months are you seeing that outside of the midwest mm -hmm. too? yes yes so, so this, this is, isn't this isn't in a, a focused you know Midwestern issue. This is happening nationally. This is happening nationally. So, um, like I said, the issue in the Midwest, um, I, I think speaking specifically to Midwestern customers, um, I think it's been the sticker shock has understandably been a little more than other parts of the country because up until relatively recently, in the last three years, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, even Iowa to some extent weren't, weren't necessarily considered high risk weather states. You know, we weren't seeing these weather patterns that we're seeing now that are resulting in you know, multi-million dollar hail claims to a, you know, a townhome community or a condo property. Um, so it seems like it's kind of come out of nowhere is that, you know, whereas people in, you know, maybe Florida have said, well, we get hurricanes, you know, we, we're used to this kind of thing. Right. But in Minnesota, um, it has spiked so quickly that it's come as a real shock, you know, frankly, to, to people in the industry as well. Really what we saw um, over the past, like I said, uh, nine to 12 months, is really all the carriers kind of, uh, you know, we had another few other storms last year in the Midwest, and that frankly resulted in the bottom dropping out of the market. Right now, um, the majority of carriers have exited the marketplace entirely. You know, I could name probably 10 off the top of my head that are just no longer writing business um, in the Midwest. You know, insurance companies are looking to turn a profit, and they haven't. You know, they've been losing money on this class of business. So, so what are you telling boards, right? You, they call you, you go to a meeting, mm -hmm. and the, the, the overwhelming majority of these board members have to be almost in a panic. Yeah. Yeah. We get that a lot. Um, I, I, I joke, I've unfortunately become an expert at delivering bad news, um, which is unfortunately the sad truth. But, you know, the approach I take is, 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 is I'm very candid with them. 
I'm not going to come into a board meeting and say, hey, look, you know, things might be better six months from now. We'll remarket it six, from, six months from now and we'll find you something better. Now, look, there are cases where that, that might be true on a case by case basis. If there's an open claim, something like that. But, you know, for the vast majority of these associations and these board meetings, what we're, what we're having to go in and say is, look, this is unprecedented for us too. The market is at such a place that um, there isn't necessarily a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, eventually, yes, the market will correct. These markets are cyclical. It will come back around eventually, but there will more than likely, unfortunately, be a little bit more pain before, you know, we get out the other side of it. What's their reaction to that? You know, it's usually gratitude for just being honest with us and, tell, and telling us that, hey, you know, is, is anyone happy about the situation? No. But, you know, when you really break it down and explain kind of how we got here, um, and I could go into granular detail about, you know, claim patterns and hail patterns over the past, you know, five, six years that have gotten us here, you know, people really, they understand it. They don't like it, but I don't like it. I'm a firm believer that, you know, I don't want someone putting lipstick on a proverbial pig, you know, and saying that, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be just fine in a year from now uh, when, it, when it may not be, you know. It's always important about managing expectations too. I don't, I don't want to make promises to my clients that I can't keep. That's kind of the approach I take. And genuinely, genuinely people react, you know, their, their understanding of that. What are some misconceptions, Trey, when it comes to a board's evaluation of insurance policy? So some boards might say, we can't afford this increase. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. too substantial. Mm -hmm. Here, we're already increasing dues aggressively to combat maintenance issues and try to fund our reserve account. We've mm -hmm. got projects that we want to do. We're not really accustomed to handling an increase in insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, for those boards that are like, maybe we just don't have insurance or like, what are some of the extreme responses that you would advise against? Yeah, we, we get that a lot. You know, the, the, the most common refrain we get is, <clears throat> it's two things. Uh, what if we just don't carry insurance? Really? You, you get, you have boards that are saying that? I've had more than one board say, what if we just self-insure? We just put some money aside and if something happens, it happens. Uh, <laughs> I, I have That's had, risky. I have, it's, it's, it's risky and it's, it's, it's foolish. I'm willing to bet that every single association's governing documents require to have them carry insurance. So you're probably in violation of your governing documents as well. But the other thing I hear is, well, what if we just, you know, exclude coverage for wind and hail? Because wind and hail is obviously is obviously any association's bi biggest exposure. Um, and the answer to that is uh, also a, a big no-no. Um, so I'll speak to the first one first, just not carrying insurance. So um, if an association were to elect not to have an insurance, um, I don't think I need to explain why that's necessarily a bad decision. There are multiple reasons. Uh, you'll never be able to sell a home in that association. You're never going to get funding <laughs> from, from a lender. Um, you'll never be able to buy a home in that association. Um, not to mention the board who, you know, we're dealing with directly are putting themselves at a massive liability. Well, I was going to say, I mean, a homeowner finds that out. They have every right to sue, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, it's I not, a, they it's have not an obligation a, to sue. It's you know? not, you know, that doesn't help when you sue, the ironic piece about suing your association is you're suing yourself, essentially, yeah. as a homeowner. Yep. But, I mean, they would have grounds to do so. Mm -hmm. that, that's a big deal. It's a, it's absolutely a big deal. So it's um, it's it kind of half-joking, tongue-in-cheek, but to those boards, I usually say, okay, if you go that route, make sure that you you know go out and buy a $10 million DNO, directors and officers policy, because you will get sued. You're going to be sued. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but, but anyway, all that aside... Um, that that is a, a bad decision to go that route. The what I you know kind of call the happy medium response is folks say, well, we know we have to have insurance, but what if we you know add a wind hail exclusion? There are wind hail exclusions out there. Certain carriers are now putting them on policies. Others you can do it optionally at your own risk. Also a bad decision. Um, it's funny because hail seems to be kind of what's gotten us in this position with the weather patterns over the year. But when you're talking about a wind hail exclusion, you don't really think about the wind. You know, you don't think about Think about the wind exposure. Well, wind also means tornado losses. So hmm. hail is a secondary concern at that point. You know, you could you know you could potentially save up enough money to fund a hail claim on your own, not a tornado claim. You know, if that comes through, straight line tornado comes through, it could destroy the entire property. You have no insurance on that. You're you know you have no coverage for that claim. You're back to the previous scenario that we talked about. So again, also I should note that Fannie and Freddie are not offering funding for um, associate or homeowner, excuse me, or potential buyers that 
are moving into a property that don't have wind inhale coverage. So specifically, specifically, wind specifically. Inhale specifically. So you are effectively pigeonholing your your residents by doing that. So two two kind of drastic responses we do here from time to time would would highly advise against them. Now. Um, there are other ways that boards can look to mitigate their premium. I mentioned it before, but increasing deductibles, um, that used to have a little more, a little more power than I think it does now uh, because rates have risen so high that each carrier has their minimum premium threshold, you know? So, you know, if you have a 10,000 or excuse me, let's say you have a $10,000 deductible. Let me, I'm just going to back that up. Mm -hmm. We'll cut this out. I want to. I think one of us should ask that question. Like, okay. what, you know, how, what are boards doing to combat your premium? Yeah. Yep. So maybe like, aside from those drastic, you know, those drastic ideas, you know, what are some more yeah. effective ways? Yeah. Yeah. So aside from the drastic ideas that these board members are coming up with to, you know, get out of paying these high premiums, what other, what other options do these board members, what do you tell them? What other mm -hmm. options do they have to, to decrease their premium payment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are there are uh, there, there's there's fewer options than there used to be. Um I always tell my clients that, you know, there was a time not really that long ago that you know, your agents had some negotiating power and we still do to some extent. You know, we we can, you know, it's our job to go out and negotiate rates and we do we do certainly the best we can with what we have, but with the state of the market, inherently some of that that leverage is gone. You know, carriers are having to stick to the book and stick to their guidelines much more. So, um the biggest thing that associations associations can do is look at increasing their, their deductibles, their property deductibles, maybe their wind hail deductibles. Um, this can potentially offer premium savings, same as anything else. The higher deductible you the higher deductible you carry, the lower the premium is that you'll pay. Now, um, carriers have also implemented higher minimum premium thresholds now on on specifically on larger accounts. So that may mean that you know increasing from a twenty-five thousand dollar deductible to a fifty thousand dollar deductible might not have the same premium reduction impact as it might have a couple of years ago, um, but it should still move the needle a little bit. So that's one option to consider. Uh, it, you know, it's not without risk. You know, that's not for everybody. You know, if you're if you're looking at going to a fifty or a hundred thousand dollar deductible, you know, you realize that you're self-insuring up to that threshold. So uh, if you're going to do that, make sure that you're financially sound and you know your reserves and whatnot are in good good standing that you can actually do that uh, without absorbing too much risk. But that is that is really still the primary option that boards can look at doing. You talk about, um, we've talked a lot about wind and hail. Mm -hmm. I think it would be beneficial to break that down, mm -hmm. right? So um, in layman's terms, a hailstorm comes through, mm -hmm. wind and hail, tornado comes mm -hmm. through, hail comes through. Mm -hmm break out the what's the association gonna mm -hmm. owe for their deductible mm -hmm. versus you know what it's been in the past in the past mm -hmm. it might have been just like a what ten or twenty thousand yep. dollars per occurrence yeah or maybe per building yep. now with the percentages which have ranged from what a few years ago they were two percent two percent it's not now five percent is the norm um and carriers are going up to ten percent now ten percent wind and hail yeah. so let's use that as a scenario mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, 10% wind and hail, and you have a, a hundred unit townhome community mm -hmm. that gets hit pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Obviously they have a claim mm -hmm. and they want to pursue it. Yeah. So let's say, um, let's say there's a 10 building community. Let me say 10. So 10 building community, um, each building valued at a million dollars a piece. Let's just, let's just use round numbers here. Um, a 5,000, excuse me, a 5% deductible. Let's cut this out. Let me back up. Um, Give it to be like a little bit more realistic. So let's say it's a hundred unit townhome community. So right? I think they're not going to be a hundred grand. So I think it, so I think in terms of buildings, how many buildings? Cause it's a per building. So how many wind buildings? and hail is per building. Yeah. So, so, so frame it as X number of buildings. Um, okay. And what a 10% of a 10% of a million dollar building is. So what a hundred grand as opposed to like a 5%, which is 50,000. Sure. Okay. Okay. So, as an example, you have uh, 10 buildings in an HOA and they have a 10% wind and hail deductible. Yeah. Assuming building values to make it easier are, you know, a million dollars per building. Yep. Yeah, that's a good question. So 10% um, deductible, excuse me, percentage wind hail deductible is based on the building's value. So you have a million dollar building 
if a hailstorm, winter hailstorm, tornado hailstorm were to affect that building, it would be subject to a deductible equivalent to 10% of a million dollars. So $100,000. Per building. Per building. So now you're talking about the the deductible is actually a million dollars. A million dollars. So $100,000 times 10, times 10 buildings is a million dollars. And that's what the association has to come that's up with. That's what the association has to come up with. Now, I would argue that with a 10% wind hail deductible, you're probably never going to hit that threshold um, in, in total damages. So effectively, you're, you're self-insuring for, for hail. Now that 10% could still come in handy if you have a tornado loss, you know, if you lose the buildings, if the buildings are actually destroyed, because that obviously the damages are, are going to be much more significant. But uh, a 10%, you know, a 10% wind hail deductible for a hail claim, you're effectively self-insuring your roofs. Now, a few years ago, um, and to some extent still, you know, 5% deductibles are still around. That's half, you know, that's a 50,000 per building deductible. Uh, as opposed to you know a hundred thousand, so five hundred thousand dollar deductible over the course of ten buildings versus a million, you know you might potentially still have some coverage there. But with the ten percent, which uh, carriers do seem to be trending towards, you're, you're effectively self insuring, which is a far cry from what it was you know five years ago. And so now the homeowner gets it's put on the homeowner for getting proper loss assessment coverage. Correct. Yeah. To now, cover that. Yes. Yeah, so this is this is this is more important than ever. This part of the conversation because. Um, as you know, most of your boards probably know, the board retains the right to assess that, you know, that million dollar deductible amongst the homeowners. You know, typically, you know, there's different ways to do it. Oftentimes, you know, boards just elect to set, you know, evenly assess it amongst the homeowners. Now, if that's the case, your homeowners do have recourse. They're not necessarily going to have to pay that out of pocket. Um, there's what's called loss assessment coverage on every personal HO6, you know, townhome or condo policy. And this coverage is designed to specifically cover master policy insurance related assessments that were levied by the board. So this is where, you know, if you assess a unit owner, I don't know, $50,000 for their portion of the claim, whatever it ends up being, this is where that coverage would kick in. They would pay their personal property deductible, which is usually 500 or a thousand bucks. And the policy would cover the rest of that assessment. The HO6 policy would cover the rest. So this is why right now specifically with wind hail deductibles rising as high as they have, um, I can't stress the importance of a proper HO6 policy enough. Um, it's so critical. Homeowners and board members really need to, to be connected. They need to be in tandem with what's happening within the HOA. They can't sit on their hands and <clears throat> pretend like this isn't a big deal. Yeah. And, and they may have gotten away with that in the past mm -hmm. a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't, now you're in a position as a homeowner to, sh to shovel out or fork over mm -hmm. 10, 20, 30, $50,000 mm -hmm. if that's what the deductible is. Yeah. And I would argue that the board, uh, the obligation is, is just like it's you know, important to have loss assessment coverage now that the importance of, of communication and proper disclosure to homeowners is, is equally as important because look, if the board isn't properly notifying the homeowners that, you know, their deductible has just gone up, you know, tenfold, whatever it may be, then what's going to happen when that person doesn't have the coverage and they say, well, well, we were never made aware of this. Sure. To be fair to the boards. Yep. That's your part of your responsibility. Correct. Correct. Right. So as an agent, mm -hmm. you are going to stress that to the Correct. boards, you know, does, does Nesbitt or you write mm -hmm. the, the letter that's going to go out to the homeowners? Yep. So, yes. Give them all the information that mm -hmm. they need. Um, you know, we've, I think that's important too, to know yep. that the, you know, the boards can rely on their mm -hmm. agent to make sure that, you know, Betty is, is aware that this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. You really need to carry this. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, Another question that homeowners would probably ask is if loss assessment is kind of new to you, how expensive is that as a homeowner? Yeah. So well, to the first point, uh, the answer is yes, it is your agent's job. I mean, I, personally, our agency, myself, we personally mail out, we get the mailing list for the, excuse me, the directory from HOA assist. Um, and prior to the effective date that these changes take place, we mass mail it out to everybody. And I know uh, HOA Assist typically makes it available on the portal as well as information. So it is made readily available to homeowners. So um, I can't speak for for 
you know, some of the board's current agents. I don't know if they're doing that or not. Uh, if they're not, they should be. Um, but that's a service we do free of charge as a part of our as a part of our service to our clients. So yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, and that's something that every agent should be doing. To the next point uh, regarding loss assessment coverage and cost, um, mercifully, it is still very affordable to get this coverage um, on most HO6 policies. Rates have gone up a little bit. You know, it's still very affordable. I'd say, you know, on average to get, you know, maybe a $50,000 limit, it might cost 40, 50 bucks a year uh, total for the year on an HO6 policy. And this coverage could quite literally save you $50,000 in, in the event of an assessment. So you're telling me yep. that homeowners can pay $50 mm -hmm. annually mm -hmm. for a $50,000 loss assessment coverage. The yeah. point is it's cheap, right? Even it's if, even if it was $500 for the year, I, I'd pay, that's I'd, cheap. I'd, in you this environment, I pay a thousand bucks for it. You know, it's 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 that critical. Odds are you're going to use that loss assessment coverage before you know you have a have a kitchen fire and have to replace your 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 stove. Sure, you know what I mean. So, I would argue that there's no, you know, you can't put a price tag on that. Really, um, I will say one thing to look out for. Um, same as the commercial market has taken a nosedive, the personal lines market is in decline as well really is a direct result of a lot of these claims. So while loss assessment coverage is typically affordable, um, there are carriers that are limiting the amount that you can carry. So there are certain carriers, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that might not go all the way to 50,000 or in some cases, $100,000 in coverage. So when you're looking to increase this, make sure that you know you can get a limit that high. Um, and unfortunately that might, that might mean, you know, having to switch carriers, if that's the case, um, it's worth it. You know, do not settle for a limit that is not, you know, sufficient to what, you know, your agent or myself or your agent is recommending on your, on your annual HO6 letter. It could, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it happen multiple times. Um, and it's a really uncomfortable situation for, for the board and for the homeowner, you know, when you're having to say, look, I hate, I hate to, I hate to, you know, be the bearer of bad news, but we, we need that money, you know, and it's going to, it's, it's either going to come for your policy or out of your pocket, you know, it's just not a good situation. So yeah, it's, it's too important not to carry. Because if you don't pay that as a homeowner, you are now considered delinquent and the board has every right to send you to an attorney and potentially foreclose on you. That's where you come in. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting, which is interesting. Um, yeah, so so like I said, it's too affordable. It's too important not to carry. Um, so it, it, it's a no brainer in my book. It's critical. Yeah, I mean, as a if there's a red flag moment here, it's it's highlighting lo some loss assessment coverage. Yeah, and that's why again I say communication is key because obviously we we communicate to our clients, but what I found is that there's always you know there's always one or two right that that just drop the ball or just for whatever reason don't see the importance. Um, and and that that's that's a headache for that's a big headache for the board uh, when that person doesn't have it. So any opportunity you get, whether it's in an annual or or, or just you know, walking down the street, shooting the breeze with your neighbors, you know, if you're a board member and trust me, insurance is coming up in conversations, <laughs> you know, um, remind folks, say, look, do you have this coverage? If you don't get it. So living in an HOA can be really tricky, daunting, complex. There's a lot of fear involved being on a board sometimes of making the wrong decision, talking about, you know, various policies and coverage. It can, it can feel pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. One thing that Mitch and I hear time and time again is confusion for homeowners that live in an HOA as to why the heck do we need a master policy insurance at all? Yep. They'll say, I already have my personal coverage. What's this? Sure. We hear it all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to a homeowner that moved into an HOA, they get some either communication from their board or their HOA saying that they've changed policies okay. or they're going through a claim or there's some type of billing scenario where they're not incorporating that into their dues, but they're billing homeowners separately since the fluctuation of insurance premiums can be so dramatic. Sure. It kind of helps save them the ability to quickly pivot to a higher premium amount versus going through the restrictions, if you will, in their governing mm -hmm. documents on how much they can increase mm -hmm. their dues. Yeah. So do a homeowner that's like, I live in an HOA, I have a personal policy. Why do I need it? Yeah, a, a master question. policy insurance. So single family or multifamily? Um, there's the, the answer, there's two answers and each of them is different. So 
start off with uh, multifamily. Okay, multifamily, yeah. Multifamily, I think the answer is a little clear as to why, you know, you have to carry master policy insurance. And uh, single family, I, I think I understand why those questions come up a little bit more. But we'll start with multifamily. So the answer there is clearly, well, well I shouldn't say clearly, but the answer is that, um, you know, as a, as a unit owner, you own you own your unit, you own the interior of your unit. Typically, you know, the boundary varies depending on the governing documents. And typically that starts somewhere, you know, between the walls and in. Finished, unfinished, it varies on the governing documents. But let's just say it's the walls and within. That's what your HO6 personal policy is responsible for. But if that building burns down or if it blows down a tornado, that's all that policy is going to replace. It's not going to build the exterior of the building. It's not going to you know, put new studs up to rebuild the structure. That's where the master policy comes in. That's where there's shared ownership. Um, and that's why you have to carry a master policy because the exterior and the studs, the foundation, the studs of your building, um, the structure are are what the the board and the and the association is responsible for, which is why it's so expensive. Which is why it's so expensive. Well, think about it. You know, you might think, well, my my unit, you know, it's only three hundred fifty thousand, four hundred thousand dollar unit, whatever it may be. But my master ins- insurance policy is costing me, or it's costing the association, you know, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. You know, well, that's because you're insuring, you know, I, you know, a twenty five million dollar building or buildings rather. Um, so, you know, you have to look at it in context. You know, I understand the rates are, I, trust me, I agree. The rates are, the rates are high right now. But um, when you look at it in the context of, hey, you know, we're, we're insuring what really amounts to a commercial property here is, is really what it is. And that's how it's classified. Um, you're insuring something much larger than just the unit you're responsible for. So, and that's, you know, that's one of the, you know, I, I've heard from many folks, they say, well, that's kind of a drawback of living in a, in a, in a multifamily association. And I would argue that, that sure, you know, that, that, that might be viewed as a drawback. I think there's also a lot of really good benefits living in a multifamily community. Um, but, you know, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. So um, speaking, switching gears to single family, this is where I kind of understand why folks are thinking, well, I insure I actually insure the building I live in. You know, I insure this house. I insure the four walls and the interior. I insure everything. Why am I paying dues towards a master policy? And I get that. Um, I will say typically for, well, almost always for multifamily associations, the premiums are substantially lower because you're not paying to insure, you know, a wide swath of buildings. You know, you're not actually insuring the, the property itself unless you have a community building like a pool house or a you know, a pergola, there is some property insurance there, but on the whole, that's much more affordable than insuring, you know, a, a 20 building townhome community. So, um, but the reason you're paying for that is for those items I just mentioned, it was community owned items that, that, you know, whether it's an irrigation system, fencing, a monument at the front of the neighborhood, uh, a pool, pool house, those are the things you're insuring from a property standpoint. You're also insuring your general liability. Um, this is, your, you know, your classic slip and fall insurance. Someone's walking down the street, uh, it's icy, um, and they slip, they fall, they get injured. That's what's covered um, on the general liability portion of the association's policy, which is critical. You have to have that coverage um, because you know the board of the association could potentially be sued for negligence if they didn't, um, and, uh, and and that's an issue. So that's why we carry your general liability. Uh, also, you know, there's the other lines of coverage: directors and officers. That's what directly protects the board. You know, it, it provides coverage if an allegation of, um, you know, you know, negligence by the board is brought forward. You know, let's say we, we hired a vendor, he did a bad job, or we hired, you know, we, we made a decision with the finances and it didn't work out the way we thought. And, you know, so-and-so is, could be sued potentially personally for that. So that's why you have that backstop of directors and officers coverage to protect the board members. You also have crime insurance, which is uh, critical. Um if a board member or or even a property manager or, or or an accountant were to you know embezzle their funds, you have you want to make sure you have coverage for that as well. And specifically, you know, when someone else is hand, handling your finances, it's not, not a knock on HOA assist. You know, obviously you're not going to do anything wrong there, but there have been cases on a national level where you know a property manager or a financial manager steals a client's money. You know, someone that's responsible for the client's money steals it. And, you know, you want to make sure you have coverage in place for that as well. So um, those are the primary lines of coverage uh, for any HOA. And that's why it's critical. That'll so, never happen here, Trey. No, and I don't think it will. But <laughs> but when I say, you know, when I say, why why is it important to carry? There are There is precedent, right? right. So, yeah. So if there are critical policies that and coverage that HOAs and boards need to have, 
how critical is it that they find an agent very familiar with the association industry, right? Yeah. Because it's not just every insurance agent out there is mm -hmm. capable of yeah. really knowing the proper coverage, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, shameless plug, right? This is kind of this is kind of what I do for a living. You know, we specialize in community associations. We insure a lot of them. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, you know, community association insurance is is pretty unique. Um, there's a lot of uh, intricate you know, differences and details that, you know, pertain to a nonprofit community association that might not necessarily apply to, you know, a main street retail shop, you know, um, they're, they're very different animals. Specifically, when I get into talking about, um, you know, some of those ancillary lines of coverage, like crime directors and officers, um, and even, even general liability as it pertains to a, to a community association, it's just different. Specifically property insurance, um, very few people are properly versed on, you know, where the master policy starts and where the HO6 policy begins. Um, and the answer is it, it depends. It depends on the governing documents. It's different based on every, you know, the way every set of governing documents is written. And, you know, you want someone that's versed um, in, in reading that kind of language to, to help you out there. Someone that's been to the board meetings, someone that, you know, has seen, you know, all the questions that, that, that might come up and, and knows what they're talking about. Um, and again, that's, that's something that we pride ourselves on. We're able to do that. And uh, it's an area that, that, yeah, there, there are other agencies out there that focus on this, but it's, uh, they're few and far in between. So whether, whether it's with us or, you know, hopefully it's with us, but if it's with somebody else, then make sure that they're versed in this. Cause I have seen situations where a client might, might, um, we've had clients leave us, you know, and, you know, another agent might offer them a savings of, you know, thousand bucks or so. Well, there's probably a reason why you're, why you're saving that money. You know, it's like anything else you get what you pay for. Um, and when you're dealing with, you know, being responsible as a board, being responsible for other people's belongings, their homes and the potential liability, you want to make sure that the person that's procuring that for you knows what they're doing. Where is the HOA insurance industry going Trey based on the trends that you're seeing? Yeah. So, um, like I said at the outset, you know, I, I always try to be honest with my clients and, and colleagues and, and, and look, I, I, I don't see it turning around just yet. I think we're going to be, you know, we're going to have to go through a, little, through a little more pain before it gets better. Um, if anyone tells you they can predict the future on today's market with any degree of accuracy, they're lying to you. <laughs> um, there are news releases or press releases from carriers every day that are, you know, getting conflicting information. You know, I have a standing call with my carriers each week just to kind of get the with my top carriers just to kind of get a feel for what's going on and things are shifting on a week to week basis. So, um, there is no concrete outlook, but what I can tell you, um, based kind of anecdotally on some of these conversations I'm having is that, you know, a lot of the insurance market right now is driven by the reinsurers. And I don't, I don't mean to go too into the, to the weeds here, but a lot of these overseas reinsurers are the insurance companies that insure the insurance companies. So, you know, ABC association might be insured by, travelers, auto owners, you know, wh whatever the carrier might be. Well, they also have a reinsurer that helps offset the load when they have, you know, when they hit a certain claims capacity. So, you know, the reinsurers are really kind of dictating terms to the carriers. And what we're hearing from the reinsurers right now is that likely as of today, you know, if, if conditions continue as they will today and, and they might not, you know, they're saying 2026, we might start seeing some relief. Um, Again, a lot of things have to go well between now and then for that to happen. So that's kind of what we're hearing. When you talk about some relief, so that's two years mm -hmm. from today. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard, we've seen it. You know, Daniel, you mentioned the doing premium assessments, insurance premium assessments separate from dues to help communities budget properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there's 450 plus percent, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. isn't a joke. That's real. Oh, yeah. 450 yep. plus percent mm -hmm. premium hikes. Yep. So when you talk about two more years, can that same association, ABC Townhomes, that had a 400%, 300%, even 100% increase in their premium, yep. can they expect that 2025? Or is it going to is it going to be you know relatively the similar to what? It was after the after the hike, or are they going to look at okay? You know, my my premium went from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand mm -hmm. this year. Now it's going to go to one hundred fifty or two hundred thousand mm -hmm. next year, and it's going to get that much worse mm -hmm. before it gets better. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, 
again, you know, I hedge my bets a little bit here. It's it's tough to predict the future, but but what m my feeling is that a lot of these, you know, severe, massive, hundred plus percent increases, that was kind of the carrier ripping the bandaid off. They were playing catch up a little bit because the property might have been, you know, underrated, meaning the premium they had it a little bit too low, and the carrier felt like, okay, we need we need to get this to a level that that we can that we think we can be profitable at. So in the cases of these giant extreme increases that we've seen, um, I like to believe that that was kind of a one-off. That's not to say the premiums aren't going to go up anymore because they will. The rates are not going to get, the rates aren't going down. Um, but instead of maybe a 200% increase, you know, maybe that that comes back to earth and it's, you know, a 30% increase, which, which is still a large sum of money, but, you know, it's better than 200%. So um, there have been associations that, you know, I mean, I'd say the average that I'm seeing right now, um, let's take the outliers out of it. Uh, and, and it's tough to take them out because th there's plenty of outliers. You know, when we're talking about 200, 300% increases, we're seeing it. But the average I'd say is, you know, 35, 45, maybe 50% increases we're seeing right now. Some less, you know, uh, I, I presented a real renewal to a client today, actually, that was 10% premium increase, which I bet they were thrilled. Actually, they thought it was too much. <laughs> uh, they, Don't you wish we could do that? Yeah, yeah, sometimes? yeah. Like, no offense to yeah. the people watching, but yeah. well, and that's real. So yeah. there, these boards out here, justifiably so, are are you know rubbing two nickels together to to make a dime. Yeah, and is that the right term? Yeah, I think so. We'll we'll anyway, go with it. We'll go with it. We'll go with it. And. Now the the purse strings are so much tighter on everything else in the budget. Well, that's the so. Thing. It's not even, just insurance. Even yeah. for even for me, mm -hmm. if if you know we send a a ten percent increase on a our average fee is like three hundred fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. So you're talking thirty five dollars a month. Mm -hmm. I will hear from that mm -hmm. that board member. Yeah, yeah. And you know, so <laughs> we can't we can't. It, it's hard for the other businesses yeah. to keep up with costs mm -hmm. salaries are the biggest one mm -hmm. right yep and and because of what's happening on the insurance side mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right it's 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 forcing other vendors yeah. to stay low which is good yeah. right i mean that's yeah. good for the board but everyone is so um you know fractured mm -hmm. by what has happened on your side yeah. That it's making it really difficult for other vendors, oh, even sure. a lawn care vendor, yeah. to to put a another hundred dollar invoice mm -hmm. on or a hundred dollar charge on an invoice yeah. for an extra trip that they took out. Sure, um, because they will hear from the board. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I believe it. I mean, insurance has become the number one item with a bullet on on every budget, um, and understandably so. Um, you know, we get but quite, you can't go without it. You can't go without it. You have to carry it. I'll say, um, you know, a lot. Uh, the comment. You know, we'll get from from boards a lot is, you know, the rates are going up. They they assume that, you know, the agents just, just get rich over here off their backs as the rates go up. And un understandably so, I'd probably ask the question as well, you know, well, what can you cut your commission? What's happening is carriers are already reducing our commission. So, you know, they're, 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 they're not all of them, but a number of them have begun to shave points off our commission. Um, so... I'm as motivated as anybody else to get, to get this back under control. You know, uh, the agent at the end of the day, you know, we're a little, I like to think we're more than a messenger, but we kind of are just a messenger. You know, we don't set the rates. So, um, like I said, you know, with the commissions, the way they are, we're motivated to get it back, back in line too. So when you find yourself or all of us find ourselves in a situation where you've got, um, inflation, mm -hmm. um, the general conception or, you know, perception for people is companies, like you said, are getting greedy. Yeah. You know, they make that assumption with oil and that may mm -hmm. be exactly true, yep. but to say that or place that same assumption mm -hmm. on the insurance industry, you're saying mm -hmm. is, is inaccurate. In other words, they're not necessarily capitalizing mm -hmm. on, you know, the, the trend, if you will, using this as an opportunity to charge HOAs more, mm -hmm. this has a lot to do with weather mm -hmm. and the response of agents to that weather or the yep. response of insurance companies to we weather patterns. Yeah. I mean, so, so insurance companies like everybody else, their goal is it, it's, it's insurance is, is just risk management. It's, it's, it's gambling effectively. You know, you're, you're gambling that, you know, 
I'm going to allow you to pay me this much and I won't have to pay out more than that. You know, if you're at a hundred percent loss ratio, you're not making money. Well, the statistic that, that keeps getting thrown around and to my knowledge, it's pretty accurate is that in the state of, we'll use Minnesota right now, state of Minnesota over the past, you know, several years, insurance companies for every premium dollar they have brought in on multifamily, they've been paying out almost a dollar 50 in claims. So you know, they're, 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 they're getting, they're getting smoked on claims. So, um, yeah, the assumption is obviously the big, bad insurance companies and look, they've earned that reputation. Don't get me wrong. Um, I, I, I pay my insurance just like everybody else, but, um, but in this case, it's really a matter of, you know, they've been bleeding for a long time. Um, and it finally hit kind of finally hit capacity, um, in the market, just the, the bottom dropped out. So, so to uh, make yeah. a parallel of that example that you just gave, would be a community that's underfunded, hasn't increased dues or marginally increased their dues for the last 10 or 20 years, because those are out there. We all know that. And all of a sudden now, new board members come in. They Maybe they have a little bit more financial acumen. They're looking at the health of the community on paper and maybe you know tangibly looking at things that need to be done. And dues now are they they either pass a special assessment or increase dues to a point that is you know astronomically higher than it has yeah. been but for good reason yeah because they've been they've been losing yeah constantly you know I, it's it's i mean would that be fair to say i think it's a perfect comparison i you know a little bit of short term pain in my in my mind is worth stabilizing things getting things back to where they need to be i think that holds true on the example you just gave i think it holds true on the insurance market like i said just because i don't see an end in sight right now in the next two years doesn't mean that you know we're not going to get back to a level playing field i don't think rates are ever going to go back to where they were but you know a little bit of short-term pain i do think is going to be benefit because carriers are going to you know i don't think anyone's going to play quite as undisciplined as they as they once did writing at rates that they were you know five years ago it does make you wonder a little bit though on these communities, let's just use a townhome condo mm -hmm. community because that's more likely, mm -hmm. like you yep. mentioned, than a single family premium increase. Yep. yep. Um, one of these really high ones, mm -hmm. and and they're they're all over the place, and it it does make you wonder what's going to happen to you know, I don't want to say the housing market necessarily, mm -hmm. but um, people's livelihoods mm -hmm. that are on fixed incomes in these townhome condo communities that bought into this place when it was affordable. Yeah. And now I I wouldn't be shocked if if they've got to find another way to do it. They've got to move because now they can't afford an additional $400, you know, 100%. a month in in premium assessments or association dues. Like there was one uh locally here that I heard of at a forum that their dues were 300 and something. Let's call it 320. Okay. Their um, after their insurance assessment or insurance premium, you know, quote came back, which they had to take. Oh. Uh, association fees went six fifty plus ish, something like that. I mean, it was, it was double or a little bit more than double of what they were paying. So you got to believe that there's a lot of homeowners out there that say, "I can, I can no longer afford this," yeah. and and it's kind of forcing them to move. Well, it's a shame too because, <clears throat> you know, when when you retire, a lot of folks. Go the townhome route. It, it's or the condo route. It's obvious, you know, less maintenance. Um, I mean, heck, I'll probably do that when I retire. It's pretty appealing. But the way things are going right now, you're right. I think a lot of people are, are we're on the verge of having people priced out, um, just based on on. I mean, not solely insurance. A lot of things have other gone up, but insurance is definitely the biggest. You know, so yeah, it's I, I agree. I've had those conversations with with homeowners too, and they're and, you know just kind of listening to them vent, I, I feel for them, you know, and say, look, we, we moved in here two years ago thinking that this was, you know, the kind of riding off into the sunset. This is the, 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 the next step, which I would agree. I think it makes a lot of sense. And it's making a lot of buyers weary of, of wanting to purchase in an HOA. 100%. You know, it's given, it's given the association community as a whole, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, a big, um, beware yeah. sticker well, that's, you know, um, Absolutely. slapped on the side of, of every, of every one of them yep. because these, these stories go around and everyone is just saying, well, I'll never live in one of those. Yep. You know? 
because yeah. it's unpredictable. Yeah, it is. And, and unpredictable is, is the key term. I, I said at the beginning, I always start every conversation saying like, I can't predict the future, <laughs> you know, uh, and anyone that says they can, they're lying to you because it is unpredictable. That's right. To scratch the itch of those that are really fearful about the industry or how this could impact them yep. down the road more than it is already impacting them. Yep. W what would be a potential scenario if we get an increase in bad weather, yeah. tornadoes, hail, wind that result in claims yeah. um, in an area that already is at high risk. Yeah. So um, what's going to happen there? And, and and look, that's why I'm kind of keeping my fingers crossed all summer long, right? You know, kind of kind of hail and weather season um, that we don't get any. But what, what would more than likely happen um, if we had a really big storm? You know, we're talking billions of dollars in, in region wide damage. Um, Worst case scenario, the remaining standard market carriers that we have. So, so there's there's the standard market and there's the surplus lines market, the excess and surplus lines market. That's kind of your optional last resort. You know, people ask me, "Well, we'll we'll be able to get insurance?" I said, "Well, we'll always be able be able to get you insurance, but you know, it's a matter of you know what you're going to pay for it." So, my fear is that those carriers remaining in the standard market will 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 back out, they'll pull out of the market, and multifamily or associations will, you know, be considered strictly high risk. They have to go to the surplus lines market. The surplus lines mar market serves a purpose. I mean, we're already having to place business in the surplus lines market. Uh, the good news is, you know, I work with the best guy in the business. You know, if you need help there, we got you covered. But I won't lie to you, you know, the premium and the, the policy terms are not ideal. You know, um, policy premiums in the surplus lines market have to be paid in full. Or you can seek outside third-party financing, which we can offer, but rates are not not terribly good. So you're going to get burned on the billing, um, unfortunately. Coverage terms, um, we have a couple of carriers that are offering pretty good coverage terms in the surplus lines market. But as a rule, coverage terms are typically reduced. Deductibles are going to be, you know, they're going to be around that 5%. So that's going to stay about the same. Um, oh, and by the way, surplus lines carriers also require what's called a minimum earned premium. So a portion of that policy premium of the front end is earned at the, the inception of the policy, which means non-refundable. So you're on the hook for at least, it's usually 25% or 35% earned. You're on the hook for at least a portion of the year. You can't turn around and cancel it if you find a better option you know, a month from now, which you could do with a standard carrier. So um, it's not ideal, but but if we're, if we're faced with another big storm that um, it, it could really, it could really, you know, take the legs out of what's left of an already bad market. Are you seeing people, associations finance their policies? Yeah, all the time, all the time. And That's way more common now than it ever way was. Way more common. Way Is that common. recommended? I mean, look, if you can afford it, no. I, I mean, look, if, the, if you can make the finances work, and this is where, you know, where, where you know, whether it's an accountant or whoever it may be, or a property manager, wh whoever it is, comes in to find them other options, um, I, I recommend going that route first. Rates are not great on the premium financing side. We just partnered with a new financing partner, actually, which which has been better. But, you know, we're, we're looking at interest rates. The APR is anywhere from, excuse me, eight on the low end um, to you know, up to, to 15 or 16, mm. you know, the APR. So that's, that's, which is not particularly competitive. Uh, and, and by premium financing standpoint, or from a premium, premium financing perspective, that actually is competitive. So if you can find another way to do it, to pay in full, I'm going to recommend doing that for sure. So many HOAs, boards, I don't know if necessarily homeowners are, are thinking this way, but certainly board members can think this way. Mm -hmm. Their roofs are 20 years old, 15 yep. years old, they find out that a storm's going to come through that could potentially result in a, in a claim for hail. Yep. There might be some excitement there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, they're going to get uh, a new roof for mm -hmm. a fraction of what it would be out of pocket. Yep. Um, however, it results, uh, you know, it comes up on their loss runs. Yep. Right. So yep. how would you explain just loss runs? There's board of directors that are self-managed around the country that are you know, out getting bids for their insurance mm -hmm. on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that requirement is loss run. So what's yep. a loss run? And then what is that? A, that does that end up biting them on the back end that they have, you know, a, a covered claim resulting in a new roof? Yay. Yeah. But then 
how does that affect their premium going forward? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So if you ever shopped your insurance policy, if a board's ever shopped their insurance policy, they've been asked for loss runs. So it's a requirement. Every carrier wants to see loss runs. Loss runs are just a, a term for your, your loss history. So uh, the carrier is going to need typically at least three years. Uh, some require five years of, of currently valued, meaning, it's, meaning the loss runs have been pulled recently of loss runs. So they can see what claims you've had over the past few years, if you have any claims open. Uh, if you have claims open, um, it's going to be virtually impossible to find you know, a standard market solution. You know, we, that's probably going to have to go to the surplus lines market, um, just because carriers don't want to get on a property that has an open claim. They have known unrepaired damages. Um, but a carrier, a, a, an association's loss runs can, can play a pretty big role. You know, um, Typically, underwriters are looking at two things, severity and frequency. Um, there are shock losses that happen, whether it's a fire or even a hailstorm. You know, um, it's, you know, there's a really big number attached to it. They paid out a big amount of, they paid, a, paid out a big settlement on the claim. Um, it, but if they've had otherwise pretty good loss history, underwriters, to some extent, can look past that because, hey, it's a one-off. You know, it's a one-off situation. Now, you know, if you have a, if you have a million dollar hail claim, you know, they're, they're not going to just write that off. You know, they're, they're, they're going to underwrite for that and it, it will likely affect your premium. There's just no way around it. Um, I would argue what looks even worse are, is frequency, frequency. So if you see, you know, like let's take a condo building, for example, if you see, you know, recurring water damage claims of, you know, 10 to $15,000, if you have two claims, you know, a year, that's going to be a really tough hurdle to get over because what that tells the associates, what that tells the underwriters that, Hey, they have a, they have a systemic water issue here. You know, we don't want to get on it and buy a claim, which is almost certainly going to happen. So frequency is something that they're looking at equally, if not more than they're looking at severity. But, um, I was, I was going to ask you that Yep, because you talked about old roofs and you know, you might be excited cause you, cause you're going to file a claim and you're going to get a new roof. Yep. What would you say to the boards that maybe in the last 10 years mm -hmm. have filed claims? You know, you might have in Minnesota, Texas, Colorado, some of these, some of these high impacted weather states, a, a, a community that has had three sets of roofs put on in the last 10 years. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you say to those boards? Now, let's, for example, two years ago, new roof goes on mm -hmm. this year hailstorm comes through yep. damage is assessed yep. and they're like yep you you know you do have hail damage yeah um i'm sure it i'm sure it the severity of that damage obviously plays a key role but yeah what, what do you tell these boards that that do have, you know, three to five years ago they just got brand new roofs mm -hmm. and now they have another claim yeah. what's your advice first of all, look your deductible. How big is your deductible? If the deductible is, you know, 5% and you're going to incur, I don't know, $700,000 in a deductible, how much more are you going to get in the claim settlement? If it's only $100,000 more, you, you, you might pay that out of pocket. You know, I mean, I know $100,000 is a lot of money, but you're looking, if you have multiple hail claims, and you know, a relatively short amount of time, that's going to be, a, that's going to be a, that's going to be tough for an underwriter to get over. You know, they're going to look at loss history on that and they're going to say, look, this, this is an issue. Um, not necessarily with the association. They've had, yeah, they've had some bad luck. You know, they've been on the path of these storms, but it's still an issue. You know, you've had, you've had three roofs in six years, you know, we might not want to take that risk on. So is uh, there a negative view of the board that says, yeah, we got some hail, but you know, we're just going to, we're not going to file a claim. Oh gosh. No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, as long as everyone's in agreement, I, I, I think, um, you know, I always tell my clients, they, they call me asking this question, what should we do? And my answer is, um, look, you have insurance for a reason. If you have a claim, you know, I'm not going to tell you to not file it, but I would, th I would think about it. Um, and I've had, I've had plenty of clients opt not to file a claim. Um, and they might, they might, um, special assess, you know, as an alternative mm -hmm. to filing a claim. Um, and, and, you know, it goes really well, it goes really well, yeah. you know? Um, but again, I go back to communication is key there. You need to explain 
to homeowners why we're not filing a claim here. Um, because homeowners might find that out and be like, well, well we have, that's what we have insurance for. Right. And you're exactly right. 